The John O. Pandolfi Studio is a 4,250 square foot space in a 100 year old rusting former soap factory. It overlooks the Hudson in Jersey City, New Jersey. Here, Pandolfi makes his signature stoneware ceramics for his restaurant clients. Penn, John O's Boston Terrier and honorary co-founder, explores the room while the team diligently works. Pandolfi, who is tall, wiry, and intense, is usually tirelessly buzzing around the room, adjusting equipment, glazing product, fixing kilns, checking orders. But right now, he wants to show me one of the core innovations that he believes makes his ceramics practice special. A problem he solved to fulfill an order from New York's 11 Madison Park, his signature client. The question was, how do you make an 11 inch plate? That's the challenge. Keeps a lot of potters like me out of the business that I'm in right now, which is hospitality. Because you can't make 250 11 inch dinner plates. Pandolfi puts down his coffee cup on the table and studies the press sheet of clay in front of him. Its surface has been carved up by knife into identical circles. Pandolfi pulls and separates one of the heavy one inch thick discs out of the clay. He quickly studies its shape before plopping it down neatly into a circular mold on his potter's wheel, firmly smacking the clay to make sure it's evenly flush. He pumps the pedal below and the wheel starts to smoothly and silently spin. He presses the tool into the soft surface and pulls it out radially from the center. The clay quietly erodes and evolves. Next comes the innovation in question, the jigger, which is a shaping tool potters use to make flatware. Pandolfi's is modified to work opposite from how jiggers typically work. We jigger, we jigger everything face up. A lot of jiggers work upside down, so you jigger the back of the plate, and then you can't control what the face looks like. We can take an eight-inch plate and make it two dozen different ways. This makes intuitive sense. Why focus so heavily on the side of the dish the food never touches and the diner never sees? With a wet cloth in one hand, he lowers the jigger's mechanical arm until the fiberglass blade makes contact. Clay flicks and peels off the surface like wooden pencil shavings as the jigger quietly carves rimmed walls into the spinning disc. Suddenly, magically, you're staring at a plate. 800 miles away in western Chicago, Czech-born Martin Kastner, a design polymath, is brewing coffee in his studio's kitchen. He's been pondering a coffee making process that better balances quality, cost, and efficiency. It's one of his quote, pet projects. Projects that he tackles purely out of intellectual interest. But he can't seem to find the time to get this one done. It's, uh, you know, that's been one that I'm slowly working on. Unfortunately, this part is like, you know, it always gets pushed aside when the other, other parts of, of our activities are keeping us busy, so it's kind of like it's what, what, what I do in the extra time, and there's less and less of that. Kastner's other activities are his main work, designing beautiful, curious contraptions that rethink the conventions of fine dining. He's best known for his decade-long collaboration making service hardware and other objects for Chicago's Alinea, the flagship concept of avant-garde chef Grant Ackett's. Like Pandolfi, Kastner operates his crucial detail studio in an old industrial building, this time a bicycle factory. Its aesthetic is a mix between gritty industrial museum and lighthearted laboratory. The old bicycle paint line, which is a conveyor belt of large hooks running along the ceiling, still functions. Between the spray booth at the end of the line and a ceramics kiln, is a presser casting machine that he describes as, quote, my $50 version of a $50,000 casting machine. He modeled it after an improvised process he saw in Thailand. Across the room, there is a smart oven that he uses for glasswork, metal casting, material burnout, cooking meat, and baking bread. It's actually a really good cooking oven. I think I, sold, I, I convinced Dave Barron when he opens his place in LA that he needs that, you know, maybe a bigger version of it. Because it's, you know, it's relatively inexpensive, it doesn't take a ton of power, and it's, very, it's relatively precise, too. I think in five years' time, it's going to be in every modern kitchen, <laughs> restaurant kitchen. Kastner has a knack for squeezing conceptual and abstract questions from his surroundings. And he has a surplus of ideas. 
I put obstacles in my way on purpose so they would, I would not forget about him. An old thesis project of wire and drinking straws that simulates the behavior of air in a room hangs from the ceiling in the middle of his office. Rough sketches and notes cover his do not forget me wall, which he asks us not to photograph too closely. This is both because the information is proprietary, but also because Kastner doesn't like communicating in sketches and renderings. I generally try to avoid communicating with people in those terms and just, you know, let's talk about the ideas behind it, let's talk about material choices, let's talk about the meaning of things, and then bring a physical object that they can touch, they can feel, they can relate to. Because that tells you if you're completely off or not. For restaurants at the highest end of the spectrum, where avant-garde meals last hours, cost hundreds of dollars per head, meeting the expectations of their price tag demands a lot. Constant innovation and reinvention. Service wound to Swiss watch precision. Expectation thwarting thrills. It's food and drink in the form of a personal four-hour magic show. But such bravado not only demands an illusion, but also someone to design and create the hat the rabbit is pulled out of. In response, the industry is increasingly turned away from traditional dinnerware providers in favor of more bespoke solutions. Here's food journalist Howie Kahn. Fancy restaurants used to be French restaurants. Those restaurants aren't really around anymore. They're not of the moment exactly. I think people still like to go to La Grande and celebrate the nostalgia of what a French meal would have felt like in the 50s and 60s and 70s. In their place, high society food has become more ambitious, more personal. I think we're at this interesting point now where things are very, very bespoke. The good restaurants, the great restaurants, are not going to have the same plates as the other restaurants. You're not going to go into a place that's going to blow your mind and see the same Bernardo china that was in another restaurant. I think for a restaurant to really make a mark, it's almost expected that they're going to do this customization, that you're going to see things on the table in every way that you cannot see anywhere else. But it can be a careful balance. Here's the thing, you also have to be really good as a restaurant to pull this kind of thing off. If your food doesn't match the plating, if the plating's better than your food, then you're ridiculous. Pandolfi and Kastner's clients, 11 Madison Park and Alinea, aren't just really good restaurants. They might be the two best and most important in America. Their critical bona fides, at least, would agree. Along with Eric Repair's Le Bernardin, they are the only American restaurants with the distinction of holding both three Michelin stars and a ranking in the world's 50 best restaurants list every year this decade. For six of the past seven years, one of the two has been the highest ranked American restaurant on that list. At times, the two can seem cosmically linked. Both are owned by famous pairings of a pedigreed chef and an enterprising restaurateur. Gadara and Hum at 11 Madison, Grant Ackett's and Nick Kakonis at Alinea. In 2012, the two restaurants traded kitchens for a week. Last year, both underwent nearly simultaneous, though very different, makeovers. Both have expanded into other lines of business. Gadara and Hum's Make It Nice group has moved into hospitality and fast casual. Ackett's and Kakonis owned three other highly regarded restaurants and an online reservation system called Talk that 11 Madison Park recently started using. But they're decidedly different experiences. 11 Madison Park straddles modern and traditional notions of heightened service and fine dining, while Alinea positions food as expectation-defying, mind-blowing future theater. This dynamic extends all the way to the creative collaborators they have in Pandolfi and Kastner. Here's Howie Kahn. You have someone like John O. Pandolfi, who is a ceramicist and is working in the style of a traditional craftsperson, really honoring where that stuff comes from and then how to do it. Someone like Martin is an avant-garde thinker. He's not working in the same framework as someone who's creating plates and bowls and knives and forks and other things. 
Pandolfi, who was first drawn to ceramics as a teen because of its sense of primal permanence, approaches his work with an austere practicality. One of his mentors at Skidmore College, Regis Brody, stressed the importance of scientifically understanding each stage of the ceramic process. Functionality was a design constraint that excited Pandolfi. It set him off on a two-year odyssey designing teapots. It was transformative. I spent junior and senior year making teapots. I was making gorgeous functional two-cup teapots. I was making four-foot-tall abstract teapots. Everything in between. I just liked the constraints that that put on me as an artist. I said, what can I do? How crazy can I get and still have to have a spout that pours well and a lid and it contains liquid? So I love the constraint of that. And it, that's, that energized me as an artist. And that, that was two years worth of artistic exploration right there and pushed me to the top of my class as an art major at Skidmore, pushed me as an artist. His mindset in his work with Eleven Madison Park is the same. If you just say make whatever, I'm no, I don't know. I don't know what to do. But if you put constraints on it, I can work within that and I can find and make connections and go places. And now I do the same thing, but within the constraints of dinnerware and, with, and it has to be in a restaurant, it has to fit in a dishwasher, it has to stack and, and work and be durable and functional. So that's my new set of constraints. Kastner too was initially drawn to old traditional arts because of a fascination with permanence. Somewhat bizarrely, the man who would create the space age objects to match Akats's space age food first trained as a blacksmith, restoring metalworks in a Prague castle. In graduate school, he also studied weaving, papermaking, and carving. You know, you're always having to retrace somebody else's steps because you're restoring pre-existing work that needs to be restored in a way that's consistent with the context of the time, uh, with the location and technology available to the people that, that produced it. It's interesting because you're learning a lot with every project and it makes you really hyper aware of contextuality of all these objects, you know, kind of like how their meaning has shifted, how the ability, how their ability or our ability to make things has shifted. Two events shifted Kastner's belief in the permanence of objects. First was the reality-altering 1989 Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia during the collapse of the USSR. It just turned the world upside down. You know, the truth was no longer the truth and then some other truth was the truth. And it just completely transformed a lot of the social structures. It puts everything into question, like what can you trust? What can you believe? Up to that point, you're just not used to questioning things. Second was moving to the United States 10 years later with his American wife and witnessing the difference in how Americans and Europeans treat objects. In Europe, the society was still very, like people valued objects. Objects had meaning and things had meaning. It, it just didn't seem that way when I came here. You know, from our common infrastructure to things that people touch, that people use, people here just destroy shit. That in a way that I had never seen anywhere else. I was kind of like, why are people just not, why, why is this happening? In searching for an explanation, he concluded that the object itself is not important, but rather what service it does for the person using it. It made me realize the boundaries are not, are fake. Like they don't exist. They're there for the consumer, right? They're not there for me. They're not there for the discipline. They're not there for the essence of things. They're there because whoever is going to buy into it or consume it needs to, needs to know what they're looking at. So if we can disregard that, if that becomes unimportant, then all of a sudden all these boundaries are gone. His approach is thus fairly abstract. Kastner interrogates a function and finds a form that intuitively and purely serves that function, free from the constraints of preconceived notion or tradition. How can hot and cold be served together? How can time change a cocktail's flavor? What is the purpose of a menu or a table? From his white orderly office on the second floor of the restaurant, 11 Madison Park co-owner Will Gadara explains his team's philosophy of service. He tells me, When you sit down in a restaurant, we try to craft this experience with a story that maybe you don't remember everything you ate and drank, but you definitely remember the overall vibe of the place. And one of the things that 
gives us the ability to make that level of impact is when not only the things that you're tasting or the service that you're receiving, but also the objects that you get to touch are truly one of a kind. For Ghadara, Pandolfi fit that need. We didn't know what we were going to be getting when we started working with him, but we knew if we all got in a room together, we'd be able to come up with something really awesome because you need the technicians and the craftsmen and the, the experts, and then you get a couple other people with different perspectives who don't live and breathe that every single day, and the ideas start flowing. The relationship with Pendolfi is a true partnership. It's rarely ever we say, we want exactly this, and he makes exactly that. That's not the spirit of collaboration, right? Yep. We have an idea, and then yeah, we get it to here, and then he gets it to there. Part of the reason Ghadara knew he could trust Pendolfi is because of how long they've known each other. They met in Ghadara's high school ska band, Hydrant. I went to high school with Will. He was classmates with my younger brother. One summer, I was home from college. Will's band needed a bass player. So I was good friends with the singer. I got the call, I played bass with them for the summer. And that's when I kind of got tight with Will. The two remained close. The week before we spoke, Pandolfi put on a pottery throwing seminar themed around the movie Ghost at Ghadara's summer camp themed wedding to Momofuku's Christina Tosi. When Ghadara started running 11 Madison Park, Jono designed a porcelain plate in the shape of a pillow that impressed whom? Eventually, Pandolfi would win a contract in 2011 to do all of the dinnerware for the duo's newest venture, the Nomad Hotel. The 7,000-piece order was so large, Pandolfi had to outsource the production to a factory in Ohio. Pandolfi and his wife Erica had just had their first child. So then it was just my turn to just go out and get that work done. That was a fun nine months. It was a hard trying experience because the factory in Ohio, that did not go smoothly. A lot went wrong. Glazes got wrong. I ended up driving back and forth out there God knows how many times every weekend and I had a little baby. So I was leaving every weekend. I'd, I'd work all week and then I'd, I'd leave on Thursday morning at 3 a.m. And I'd get to their plant at like 10 a.m and work with them for the day, sleep overnight upstairs from the pottery, and then come back the next day. So that kicked off the busiest period of my life, which I'm still in. But the work got done. I'm in Broadway, flagging the truck driver down, making sure there's a spot in front of the hotel. I'm wheeling the pallet of plates into the hotel. That was just like a fun, exciting, nervous, crazy hard time. Because also, these guys are opening up boxes of thousands of plates that they bought for me and I'm like, oh shit, I hope they like it. And, and also, you know what else? I hope this stuff lasts. I hope this doesn't break in the first week. In what he calls a quote, happy accident, his stoneware design was durable and they did like it. There was so much up in the air and just as that project closed up and I just got it all done in the nick of time, and I literally, I just wanted two weeks off. I just wanted to chill with my kid and just like, not think about stoneware. And they were like, okay, Jono, we need you to come in for a meeting. Our sister restaurant, 11 Madison Park, now we're gonna redo all our dinnerware there. We want you to do it all. The restaurant had decided to work with local artisans and craftsmen for all of their service items and chose Pandolfi to be their sole ceramic supplier. His jigger design was a personal proof of concept of sorts that he could quickly design and produce dinnerware in his own studio with the level of specificity and variety a restaurant of that tier demands. When I figured that out, that was when I knew I could do all of EMP stuff here. That order and the way Pandolfi approaches one of humanity's oldest arts with fresh thinking and pure design efficiency allowed him to grow his business in a four-year period from, quote, just a dude with a kiln to a studio with five full-time staff in a 30,000-piece production capacity that is busting at the seams. I wanted to come up from air. I wanted to take a moment off because I just nailed this huge life-changing dinnerware project, but I didn't even have a moment to. I had to dive right back in, in the studio, hire new people, buy a pug mill, and that was when my production capacity here really started growing to what it is now. So if you factor in that I did the Nomad, and then I did 11 Madison Park right after that, that's a one-two punch. That kept me busy for like two years. The second I got done with 11 Madison Park, 
I had like 10 other restaurants waiting for me to call them back. While Pandolfi will sell to anyone, his client list is filled with buzzy, critically acclaimed fine dining establishments from across the country. At last count, they collectively boast 13 Michelin stars. It's made Pandolfi's signature style, heavy stoneware glazed on one side that is both durable and handmade, a popular trend in the industry. Two chefs here two days ago and you know, they said, oh man, what do you think about this whole crazy stoneware trend? You know, we think you kind of started it with Nomad and this and EMP. And I'm really flattered by that. And I don't, I don't go around saying I started it and I don't claim to have started it. But I do know that when we did our big job for Nomad, no one else was using dark handmade looking stoneware on a scale like that. Grant Ackett's found Martin Kastner in a similar bit of era-specific blind luck, like Ghidorah and Pandolfi's ska band Meet Cute, by finding his homepage on Yahoo. So when I came to the States and I started the studio, I could not afford any conventional marketing methods. So I learned how to design a website and made a website for myself. And because there is not a ton of it yet, I was scoring pretty high on search engines. So I think Grant just did like a Yahoo search. Kastner had moved to California with his wife, a professional photographer, after they finished graduate school in Ohio. So I got a random email from him that says, I'm a chef looking for somebody to design new ways of serving food. And I, without any conditions, and that was really fascinating to me. Ackett's and Kastner were natural, intellectual, and creative foils for each other. Kastner's unconventional background and way of thinking was pitch perfect for finding answers to the sorts of questions Ackett's wanted to ask. For Kastner's part, he had recently become interested in exploring food after his wife worked part-time in a bakery. But he lacked the technical culinary vocabulary and skills that Ackett's could provide in spades. The main reason I did not jump into playing with food earlier I was intimidated by, you know, like at that point, I'd spent 15 years working with metals, with wood, with fabrics, whatever. And all of these things, they're skills. They're skills that you develop over time. It's a knowledge that you acquire and kind of, you know, you have to do it the hard way. There's no easy way. And I felt like food and the culinary skill is the same thing, you know, and I kind of, I felt like I needed somebody who had already invested those 15 years in the culinary world who's thinking in similar terms where we would meet at the same place. And I could bring my perspective of somebody who's looking critically at the problems, but I also need, and I can, I can articulate form, I can art, manipulate materials of a certain kind. But I, I really needed somebody who would understand the value and the potential of flavor, texture, you know, and, and, and understand the skill set that, that's required to manipulate it. Their partnership started with small projects while Ackett's was still executive chef at Trio in Evanston, Illinois. During this time, Kastner's gift for challenging the conventions of objects became his signature. When Ackett's asked him to make a lollipop stand, Kastner answered with a riddle. Why make a lollipop stand when you can make the lollipop stand? He delivered individual collapsible lollipop tripods, but it wasn't always smooth. With the menu, I think I offended him. The first time I told him his menu made no sense because it's like that's that's what that's how they introduce the food to the diners, right? And I, I wasn't diplomatic about it. I was just puzzled by it. So they, you know, I, I, I it probably didn't go over very well. But then he called me back and he's like, "Well, what did you mean with that?" The ensuing conversation eventually resulted in Alinea's famous infographic menu. Later, when working on Trio's submission for a cooking competition, Kastner criticized the quality of the food photography and asked his wife, Lara, to reshoot them. Their photos that the restaurant had for the presentation were just horrible. And my wife, who's a photographer, came to dine at Trio with me the night before we were flying out to Spain and were eating. And I, you know, after the meal, went to the kitchen and I asked to see the photos that because I was going to write the script for the presentation. And I saw the photos. I'm like, we can't use that. You know, we need different photography. and. Um, since Lara was there, before we all went to the airport, we met in the kitchen, they made the food, and we shot it on a of paper in a dining room, and just Lara got in and, and took photos, and they came back and were like, we've never seen food photography like this, like, would you be interested in actually documenting our food? 
The couple would ultimately spend two years creating the 416-page Alinea book. When the Alinea project started, Kastner and his wife relocated to Chicago from California to dedicate themselves to it full-time. When I asked Akats' partner, Nick Kakonis, by email what Kastner has meant to Alinea, he doesn't pull any punches. A shit ton. When I met Grant, he wanted Martin to design everything, from the walls to the table to the plateware. That was obviously impossible, but Martin did our opening menus, logo, identity work, some plates, and specialty designs. But more importantly, his aesthetic sense permeated the whole of the design and understanding of what we were trying to build at Alinea way back in 2004 before we opened. Alinea's creations were, for a time, purely collaborations between Ackett's and Kastner. Kukona says, It used to be that Grant would have an idea for a presentation or an idea for a provocation of diners and then work it all out with Martin, back and forth. Sometimes Martin would lead with an idea for a design and then the culinary team would find novel uses for it. Like any great collaboration, it's tough to tell where things began or ended on any project or who contributed exactly. Ackett's and Kastner's schedules became busier and their teams grew and they naturally worked less with each other. That's why, for me, like being a maker is not that important. Like it's, it's a tool for delivery. It's a vehicle, but the vehicle is secondary to the experience. The experience is really the center point. I don't really know what to say about that. You know, it's kind of like it's normal. The other part is I start working, you know, on the culinary concepts, and when nobody has time, you know, and it's kind of like, and then he's traveling, I'm traveling, and we can't, we can never like meet in one place. So, again, it's not, you know. It feels, it feels weird to, to be talking about it publicly. Today, while he still takes on projects from restaurants, he's selective, and he'll turn away work if its concepts don't excite him. You know, like people will come to you and say, I want you to make a centerpiece. So my response to that is like, why? And they're like, well, we're, we want to change some the way we serve at the restaurant. We want the centerpiece to be a presentation of side dishes and we want the people to order the protein but share all these side dishes for the table. I'm like, so what we're really thinking about is not a centerpiece. We're rethinking the way the side, you know, the, this food is served. And that is a lot more interesting. So if I didn't get that answer, I might just say no to the project. Back in Jersey City, John O'Pandolfi is unloading a kiln, which is still one of his small pleasures. When I say I like taking finished plates out of the kiln. I'm not lying. Like I do, I unstack kilns. And to me, that's a rush to see this all like perfect sitting on the shelf. But I, you can't do that without efficiency. You need to have a really high yield. It's good Pandolfi finds pleasure in the pure productivity of his business because there's rarely time to come up for air. The firing volume of his five kilns is inadequate to meet demand. He hopes to double it and promises a major development is coming soon. 95% of their production is done on site. He hopes to introduce more outsourcing capability soon as well. The phase I'm in right now, we're really just focusing on getting out from under being in the weeds for two years. You know, just, you know, hey, we're thankful that we're making plates and we're busy as hell. But do we want to be always swamped, swamped, swamped? No. Like Kastner, Pandolfi also recognizes he has benefited from a boom in the industry. As farm-to-table menus have proliferated, his handmade stoneware has become the industry plat du jour with a variety of imitators. He tries to stay above it all. He's not slavishly devoted to the aesthetic that made him famous. And there are, increasingly, other areas that Pandolfi hopes to expand into beyond ceramics. I'll say right now, like, you know, for the for two years, I've been trying to release a lighting collection, and we've just been too busy, and we haven't had space. But well, now we have space. We're still too busy, but we're taking care of those things. So we're definitely gonna. You're gonna be seeing more lighting from us soon. Made nice, which is opening up in um, the city soon, which is um, Nomad and EMP. They they have a fast casual that's gonna be opening. So I did the lighting for that, and I've done a few lighting projects. So. Lighting is one area that I really want to get into soon. Um, I mean, I would love to be putting out a jewelry line again in the next few years, because I don't want to be known as a guy who just does um, dinnerware. He hopes that the journey will, in a way, 
lead him back to where he started. If I had to state, like, you know, a, a wish for my own company, you know, it would be that we continue to grow and we were super successful and that in, you know, five or 10 more years that my business is successful and sustaining itself and, and I can step back and, and get back into, you know, exploring the artistic side of ceramics that I, I got into in the first place. But for the moment, this is my art.